complete silence, followed by the new light. So welcome. Tonight we have Dick Russell, who, among other things, is the biographer of James Hillman. And I feel deeply honored, Dick, that you would come and join us. And I'm now going to turn this over to my friend and colleague, Will Lynn. Thank you, Dana. <clears throat> uh, well, some of you may, may know, uh, Dick is the author of multiple best-selling books. He's author of over a dozen, I think 13, working on his 14th book, uh, including uh, works on the assassination of John F. Kennedy, uh, ranging all the way to the biography of James Hillman. And he's currently working on the uh, second volume of James Hillman's biography. So if we're lucky, maybe we'll get to hear uh, some of what's coming. Um, and, and with that, we'll turn it over. I'll, what I do want to tell you is, as you know, some days uh, we go slowly through uh, presentation and ask questions as we go. And sometimes uh, uh, the guest will give us an introduction and then we'll talk. This is going to be the introduction, then talk version. Cool. <laughs> Welcome. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> and thank you, Dana, for having me. And great to see all of you here. Um, this is not, I've never done this particular presentation before. So it's, it's not typical. I've, I've lectured on James Hillman, uh, the Young Institute and other places. And, uh, but this is a, a personal story. And it's a story of how, more about how my relationship with James Hillman and how he mentored me in a way and also pushed me in directions that I think I never would have gone in my life uh, if I had never met him. So I feel like it was a fated, remarkable thing that happened to me. I was deeply privileged to have known him and work with him on the biography. Uh, the last thing I actually would have expected, I am not a psychologist, I am not a, uh, uh, an expert in psychology, but I, I knew a lot about it, and uh, certainly about Jung and Hillman. And, um, but anyway, tonight I, I, I'm going to be talking, reading a little bit from two books, um, the bio, not so much this one, this was volume one, um, and, and more, and he's in this one too, and this is a book I wrote about my son and myself, and it's called My Mysterious Son, A Life-Changing Passage Between Schizophrenia and Shamanism. And um, so, that's James Hillman as I knew him, and when I met him in 1999, my then 20-year-old son, Franklin, was still going in and out of hospitals after having been diagnosed with schizophrenia a few years before. And my relationship with James Hillman began as a, as a by accident, really, uh, through um, a mutual friend who sold him and myself and my friends, my wife, um, organic vegetables in a market in Connecticut. <laughs> and uh, a young young fellow, we were talking one day in our kitchen, and he said, "Oh, my dad, my dad sells James Hillman his vegetables." And so I called my old friend Wayne, who's an organic farmer, and I said, "So, Wayne, you know James Hillman because we'd been reading him for a few years and and really fascinated by." Uh, his work, and um, I said, could you possibly introduce me? And, and um, Wayne said, well, I don't know. He's a very private person, you know. And so I sent James Hillman a copy of my second book, which was called Black Genius and the American Experience. And um, uh, he, he liked it. And so we ended up having a lunch together. And um, during that lunch, we found that we had quite a few things in common, including one, one, of, one of which was that we both uh, had been traveling in Africa over at large part of Africa when we were very young. Um, I was in my 20s, he was in his 20s, and uh, there's James Hillman in East Africa in 1950 with two white rhinos. <clears throat> This picture is not even is not in my book. I just happened to find it today. Um, uh, at, at the at, a, at the home, at, this was a ranch that a game catcher named Carr Hartley had, and I'm just going to read you a, a little bit from uh, Volume One about Hillman and Africa and Jung and Africa also. Puer is the Latin term for a young man, and Hillman would devote an entire book to the subject, the Puer Papers. As Blake Burleson writes in his 2005 book, Jung in Africa, the African landscape is littered with puer eterni, eternal youth, who met untimely deaths. From the plane crashes of the writer Antoine de Saint-Zupéry and Dennis Finch Hatton, to the fulfilled death wishes of Hemingway and Speak, to the martyrdom of Livingstone, Africa provided the Netherlands where the shadow side of men could find expression. Jung himself wondered whether he would return from his sojourn there, and after his traveling companion George Beckwith had a premonition that Jung would die from a snake bite, 
Beckwith always walked ahead of him with a gun and ended up killing 13 deadly mambas. Wow. One friend who knew Hillman over time described him as a Pueri Turnus, and certainly in Africa he possessed that sensibility. It was not tourism or safariism. He was simply there, with no long-range ambitions, no planned article for a magazine like National Geographic, no journal keeping, and taking very few pictures before his camera got stolen. I was not living a movie in my mind, watching myself do these things, he reflected later. No thoughts of how great it was to be in Africa or anything like that. Then what was the driving force? It's a quest, but you don't know what the goal is, and you have to be up to it. I feel that the test is more important than the quest. It's being called to meet a challenge, an initiation, which at least at that age is very important and what calls a lot of young guys into the military. Asked whether he'd felt protected in some ways, Hillman responded, yeah, I think I felt I was the explorer, the adventurer, Richard Halliburton, who he knew as a boy in Atlantic City. I didn't even feel I needed to protect Kate, his then girlfriend, later his wife, I don't think. Jung, who was twice Hillman's age when he traveled to Africa, seeing a warrior standing on a rock, quote, had the feeling that I'd already experienced this moment and had always known this world, as if I were this moment returning to the land of my youth, and as if I knew that dark-skinned man who'd been waiting for me for 5,000 years. In Jung's view, as Lawrence Vanderpost wrote, Africa attracted Europeans because it provoked through its own physical character and example what was forgotten and first and primitive in themselves. Hillman's approach to Africa was apparently less psychological, but his experiences amid the various cultures prefigured pivotal events in his life and writing. 35 years later, he would become a leader at a series of men's group retreats, some lasting as long as a week in the woods of Minnesota, West Virginia, California, and elsewhere. Maladoma Somme, an initiate of the Dagara tribe in West Africa, was another of the regular participants at these gatherings, and he reflected in 2008. I had an experience first of James Hillman being an intellectual titan. He knew how to introduce a subject matter, how to develop it, and how to close it. He was so tight and his mind was so complex, like a fortress. And really, I was afraid of that fortress. Then with a group in North Carolina, I introduced for the first time a radical ritual, in this case, a water ritual. That was when I noticed James Hillman's genuine interest in ritual and the demonstration that he actually knows something about it. In the middle of the week, he called me to his side in the bush, asked me to take a piece of leaf and put it in the water and brush his body with it, which is something we know in my culture as a cleansing. So for me, to see that fortress of a mind become ritualistically alert and trusting an African guy to help him with some kind of energy that he needed to be cleansed from, uh, that really got my respect. While Jung had been profoundly moved by the vast herds of wild animals gazing and grazing in soundless stillness as they had done from time immemorial, for Hillman it was more the strength of the in, in this indigenous world, the indigenous culture, the indigenous vitality, the self-sufficiency of these people, the life of people who are pagan. So after that first meeting, there was a second, and we met uh, Margot McLean, um, an artist who became, had by that time become James Hillman's third wife. And they became acquainted with others, and I live in a, in a big extended family, and the Hillmans began, James and Margot began visiting us in our various homes, and um, we became friends. I certainly had no intention of being his biographer. I was working on other projects. Um, at one point, I was I was doing books with, uh, with <laughs> I, was, I was sort of, not a ghostwriter, because my names were on them, but I was doing books with Jesse Ventura, uh, the uh, wrestler turned governor of Minnesota, mm -hmm. and, uh, which was nice because they, they all became pretty, pretty big sellers. And then I was writing about James Hillman on the other hand. So that's a, kind of a weird combination, but it seemed to work. And, um, but we became friends, and in two th early in 2004, um, his sister was there visiting in Connecticut. 
And I was there, my wife and I, and um, she was a great storyteller. And I said to James afterwards, I said, uh, you know, you really should get some of her stories on tape while she's, she's still living, because she's older than he was. So this gave them the idea to have a family reunion and bring together that summer and have it filmed. And I knew a young filmmaker who did it. Um, uh, all of his, his, he had three siblings and um, all of his kids, he had four children, and three of them came. And they would just talk about uh, the early years and growing up in Atlantic City and and um, and it would be filmed and like a, a, a record for the family. And I was, since I was a reporter, I've been an investigative journalist for most of my years, a lot of it on the environment, I asked a lot of the questions. And then afterwards, our, our wives, Margot and Alice, sat down and, and started talking about, well, they had a couple glasses of wine, was he ever going to do a biography? And um, he never wanted to do that. He felt like everything was in his work, and that's the way he wanted it. But then they came to a conclusion that, yeah, maybe he should, and, uh, and maybe I could do it. So that's how it happened. And um, we ended up traveling. Uh, he said, you know, we talked on the phone. He said, this is not going to be a quick book. This will take years, you know. Well, it has taken years. Volume 1 came out in 2012. And uh, Volume 2 I'm still working on about halfway through it. But um, I'll get there, I think, in the relatively near future. And. Um, you know, it, it's a labor of love, really, and, and now about his legacy since he passed in, in 2011. Um, but um, we traveled together to Ireland, where he went to college, uh, to Switzerland, where he was the uh, director of studies at the Jung Institute after studying you know, when Jung was still alive in the 1950s. And then I, I interviewed dozens of people, and, uh, and he participated in the biography. He would... Uh, you know, I'd write a chapter and then I would give it to him to critique, and, and not just critique really, but to add to. He didn't try to censor me. He didn't say, you know, you, you know, leave this out or leave that out. He would, he would really leave it to me to, um, to write it, but he always had things to add to the chapters. And of course, that was amazing, you know, just a, a great privilege to be able to, to work with anybody like that, but especially him. And then um, decided toward the end of his life, um, that I would need to do uh, two volumes. And um, I wanted to finish volume one while he was still living. And uh, it didn't come out while he was still alive, but he was able to you know, see it through pretty much to, to the conclusion. And I, you probably, you may have seen it, I don't know, but the cover shows him as a boy. And I have copies of these You'll, afterwards if any of you are interested in, in getting one from me. Um, but you know, he was a boy on the beach of, of Atlantic City, which is, which is where he, he grew up. And uh, there he is as a little kid in Atlantic City in nature, which he loved very much. And then I'm going to cut to a picture of my son as a boy. He's biracial. Um, he uh, grew up part of the time on a farm that we had, a family farm in Kansas. And um, so that's Franklin, is his name, when he was young. That's Hillman when he graduated. Uh, that's his graduation picture from Trinity College in, in Dublin. And uh, that's my son graduating from Beacon High School in the Boston area. Now, he was suffering from mental illness at that time. This was He graduated from a high school that had a lot of kids with that problem. Um, it happened out of the blue, as it happens to a lot of people when Franklin was 17. He suddenly came back from a great summer in Mexico and said, I can't, Dad, I can't find my old self again. And um, then suddenly he was suicidal. And we had no idea, his mother and I and the friends that we lived with, what was going on. And I know th thousands of parents have gone through this. And he was, had to be hospitalized. Uh, he was diagnosed with schizophrenia or schizoaffective uh, disorder. And that, there, was, there were a series of, uh, a, a long time, you know, many, many years when, you know, we didn't know what else to do except follow the doctor's prescriptions at that point. I mean, you know, so he was on several different meds at one time and at one point put on, you know, a tremendous amount of weight. And it was really, really tough really a tough, tough period of years, which has an interesting, not ending because he's still alive and he's doing very well, but um, which we'll get to in the, in the course of this. But he was, um, 
he was living in a in a group home, um, and he was having delusions that he that I didn't know how to cope with. I mean, you know, we'd we'd be going somewhere, and he'd just say these outrageous things out of the blue, or at least outrageous to me, and I I didn't know how to handle it, and and uh, I would just kind of it was very off putting to me, and 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 I would just kind of you know I, I didn't know what to do, and. And, but James tuned into this, and and uh, at the same time, I was going to interview him quite regularly uh, in in Connecticut, and um, so I'm going to share with you uh, a, a section, just a couple pages in in the book, My Mysterious Son, of how James Hillman really changed my entire attitude toward my son. It was, and I'm grateful. I'll be eternally grateful for that. So by the end of September 2004, Franklin's back in the group home, but the repetitive cycle is taking its toll on me. On a trip to interview Hillman for the biography, I decide to raise the big question with which I've been wrestling. This concerns my son's delusions, which persist despite taking his medications. I explain that one fantasy is that I'm not his father, even though Frank concedes sometimes that I did raise him. He clearly does not want to be who he is. He takes on substitute identities as the reincarnation of Tutankhamun or Bruce Lee. So what do I do in the face of this? Do I accept the delusions? Do I challenge them over time? Or do I simply listen and try to figure out what my son might really be expressing underneath? My tape recorder is running as Hillman responds. You listed the choices already. I am your father. I am your father is one way to do it. Another way is you enter the delusion with him. The main aim is to maintain a conversation, I would think, to keep connected with him. He's testing you. I don't mean in an oppositional way, but just unconditional acceptance of whatever, because you really can't change anything. The tendency is to treat everything as if it's acute, but you need to accept the fact that a chronic condition is different. You have to realize that it's Kronos, the god of time. You don't look for improvement. It's really walking along with. It's accompanying, without any end in sight, accepting what is and just going along, and talking with him. Also, about things you want to talk to him about. This is a very important part about what you've been doing or thinking. Maybe he doesn't want to hear it, but that doesn't matter. The point is that you're not there out of guilt and fatherhood and all of that, but you're talking to him as a human being. Your normalcy is helpful, because nobody he talks to is normal. They all talk to him about being a sick person. I interject that I'd like to be able to tell my son, when you took this particular medication, you were able to go to school, or maybe we'd write a book together someday, but we can't do it if you're delusional. But then Franklin immediately starts arguing with me. Hillman continues, well, again, you probably have to reconstellate the relationship, not in terms of where you're trying to help him and not trying to get anywhere with him. Simply, you know where I was today? I went to Connecticut. You let go of his being a sick man. Then you may find he tells you things that he doesn't talk about otherwise. You don't know what's going to come out, but it's almost as if you've abandoned being the responsible father, because you can't move him. Okay, that's over with. Make him feel that you really want to see him and tell him things. You say, this guy drove by and I thought, I, was, I wish Frank had seen that car. What do you think of that kind of car? He might go into a delusion about the car, but it doesn't matter. You've approached him differently from the therapeutic. I interject again, and differently from my expectations of Franklin. Exactly. It's something that's not your world and not his world, like in the sense of writing a book together, or his world without his medicines, his hospitals, and all that shit. It becomes like sitting in a bar together side by side, talking about the day. Yes, I reply. He says he'd like to write his book, not with me. Exactly. This whole thing with the therapy, he's been inoculated. He doesn't want that. It drives you crazy. That's the last person I would want to see. I used to ask people, What's, what does going crazy mean to you? Does it mean you're going to lay around with your clothes off or shoot somebody? The other question is, where do you want to be? On an island with no phone, curled up in a room in the dark? Who do you want to talk to? People don't want to see therapists. They really don't. They want to go to a bar, find a lover. All I mean is, I think the most useful thing is to get around all that clinical area that in a way he draws you into, the delusions. Does it do any good, I wonder, for me to try to figure out where the delusions come from? Hillman shakes his head. Very mysterious, he says. The mystery doesn't go away. But after Hillman's sage advice, the usual way I approach my son assuredly does change, and that changes everything at least between the two of us. 
I take Frank to one of his favorite restaurants, Chef Chow's. We're perusing our menus. When the waiter comes over, Frank starts speaking to him in invented Chinese. The poor fellow looks quite nonplussed. Ordinarily, I would cringe and perhaps even mutter an apology on my son's behalf. When I instead say nothing, Franklin doesn't skip a beat. He continues speaking to the waiter, this time in English, while pointing across the table in my direction. Oh, don't worry, Frank says. He can't understand because it's Mandarin. He only speaks Cantonese. <laughs> when the waiter nods and quickly disappears from sight, I start to laugh and laugh. Frank has what we used to call in the Midwest a big shit-eating shit grin spread wide across his face, and I just keep laughing. So that was a huge, huge thing for me. And um, I began to see, after I accepted Franklin's, just who he is, you know, that you know he was amazingly psychic. He could often read my thoughts. He could tune into who I was. He could tune into things from other dimensions. And I began to really appreciate that schizophrenia is not what most people think it is. And in fact, there is an amazing otherworldly connection to other dimensions that if you pay attention to it, you know, it's, it's quite amazing. And, and you can have a whole relationship that, you know, is built, is built uh, not upon that, but with that. Now, in 2011, James was, was very ill, and he was suffering from lung cancer. And I spent several days visiting with him, going over uh, questions about the biography. And I told Franklin, and he says, oh, right, he wrote the human genome. And I corrected him after him. I said, well, no, actually, he wrote the soul's code. And Franklin says, that's what I mean. <laughs> another time, he recalled reading the soul's code with another older family member, and he recognized the title of another of Hillman's books, he said, was Gentleman Jim. That's probably what a lot of people think of him as, I said with a chuckle. And later when I told James Hillman about these two stories, he, he just loved it. He said, well, that makes my day. And by the end of that October, um, he would be dead. Uh, the day of his funeral in Connecticut, some of you may know this, uh, it snowed. The end of October, and it was the first and only snowfall of that entire winter. So a great soul had left this planet. I mentioned his interest in Africa earlier, and he was there about 20 years before I was. And uh, this, so I, I was there in uh, 1970, 71. Um, I quit my dream job with Sports Illustrated magazine when I was very young. I was a Kansas kid who suddenly woke up. There was something else going on in the world besides sports. And uh, I just left with a backpack and a portable typewriter and spent a year traveling all in Europe and Africa and the Middle East. And that's me dancing with a medicine man in Ghana. Um, it's a long story, but when I felt the spirit of dance come into me, which actually stuck with me for many, many years. Um, and I'll read you another short passage here from my mysterious son, because it has to do with what happened next, or happened twice actually in the past uh, 10 years with my taking Franklin to Africa. At some point during those first years after suffering his breakdown, Franklin had written the outline of a novel. In it he said, on his world travels he dances with an African witch doctor in a village in Ghana. People are around smiling as this half black, half white man of the people dances with their tribe. They're poor for Western standards, but they're living like they always have off the fat of the land and with love and little greed. At another incidence, he's warned of a lion that would appear and is possibly dangerous like a ghost in the darkness. He's unafraid, but for that time, decides just to stay safe and stayed in the village for that night. That night, the lion was heard outside the village as it ravaged a hyena. Now, what is curious is the composite nature of his description. For I had done just that in the course of my world travels, a journey to a small village near Mampong in central Ghana, where the witch doctor, though I referred to him as a fetish priest or medicine man, had beckoned me into a circle to dance with him. My traveling companion had taken a picture of me as a bearded 23-year-old, one leg off the ground, arms outstretched, eyes intent on the much older African man facing me clad only in a loincloth, while a younger man stood playing a large drum and the other villagers looked on from behind us. Franklin knew the photograph as I kept it framed on my office wall. Yet, of course, I was not a half black, half white man of the people from my son's imagined profile. That would have been him. Franklin then and later had expressed 
a keen interest in seeing Africa. In a journal he kept while at Beacon High School in the late 90s, he wrote, there are many possibilities for my future for traveling. I could go to Africa, Ghana or Uganda with my mom's friends or the people at the African store in Porter Square. There are numerous other references from my own journal. From October 1996, when my son was first in the hospital. On Halloween, Frank puts on the costume of an African chief. From December 1998, for Christmas I get Frank a shirt and pants African outfit that he wanted. From January 2003, again when he was in the hospital. He wants to do a craft type store selling products from Africa and other countries with profits going back to those countries. From that same month, he wants to go to school in Africa but says I won't help him. This is why I didn't talk to you today. And Franklin was asking if I wasn't an undercover African. I'd never previously imagined traveling for almost a year in Africa, and while it was a life-altering experience in many ways, afterward I never thought I'd go back. Yet there was something Franklin wrote when he was 17, a quarter century later in 1996, the same year he would have his first psychotic episode, in quotes. I'd come across the piece not long after that happened and saved it in a folder labeled Frank's writing. He wrote part of this in the first person, another part was in the third person, as if he was on the outside looking in. Where do I fit as an African-American European in this chaotic mix of a world? This question and how I look have always followed me like a gloomy ghost. In the shadow of what is tormenting, from where, from what, and how did I get here arises. Constantly I imagine myself in the societies of the past. For example, the Harlem Renaissance, the Industrial Revolution, etc. What part would I have played back then? The question of race has always followed me even when I was young and I first realized I was different. All I wanted to be was black. There was no in-between for me. I recognized something in the black culture that I adored. What is it? It is a beauty that left an eternal quest for it, yet somehow I never felt I measured up. What is it like to be black? What is it like to be half black and half white? No matter how much we don't want it to matter, it does matter. It's like one of half of you is dancing to the drums of Mother Africa and the other singing in the choirs of classical European music. That's a lot of rhythm in one person. <laughs> What's it like to live in a tribe? All of the people share common ancestry and common skin color. Wouldn't there be less competition? Wouldn't that be the definition of a perfect world? The character could be a time traveler that travels from place to place, trying to find somewhere to fit in. Is it conceivable that in Africa, half his lifetime later, he might find that missing somewhere to fit in? So we went. What happened? There we go. Oops. Back. That's 2012. We are in East Africa. We went with Franklin's uh, boyhood pediatrician who had grown up in Tanzania in the 30s, the son of missionaries, and uh, would go back every year and, and go up, take, bring friends and people on safari. And he'd always wanted to take me and, and over there, and Franklin too, and eventually he did. And uh, it was amazing. I mean, the, 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 we went through so much over there, and I'm not going to dwell on that part, but it was, there was a, one night I feared that he'd wandered off and he was lost. Uh, it was really, really um, an incredible journey that we had together and brought us together in ways that, you know, uh, we never had been before. So we came back in 2012 and he went back to school for the first time in a long time. Went to a tech school, Lincoln Tech in the Massachusetts area. Then this teacher failed him, didn't understand him, didn't get why he couldn't keep up. And so that summer he crashed in 2012 and, you know, he just went off, stopped doing taking his meds one day and went, went back in a hospital and he was there for more than a month, and I was pretty, I, I was becoming very desperate. I mean, he wasn't that young anymore. It was 2012. We'd, we'd had this incredible trip to Africa, had amazing breakthroughs, um, and uh, James Hillman was gone by now. Um, and, and I was, I didn't know what to do. I went to a conference on uh, alternatives to medication. And while there, I met a woman who knew a woman who was a shaman in, uh, in Maine. And she suggested that we, I go see her, that she might be able to help. So I, I'd read The Horse Boy, which is a great book about shamanism and, and uh, about a, a family that takes their autistic uh, son to Mongolia to see what a shaman can do to cure him. It's a terrific book. I'd read that. I'd just recently read it. So I was, I was intrigued. And my wife and I went to... Um, 
see this woman in Maine, and she was the real thing. I mean, she was really, she, she was extremely psychic. She was quite amazing. But Alice said to her at the time, my wife, that, you know, she felt like Franklin needed someone. She was like a fairy, you know. She was this kind of wonderful, very white uh, woman. And uh, Alice thought, he, you know, said to me, she, he needs somebody um, that's well, darker, <laughs> for one thing. And, uh, and then on the way home, she, she remembered uh, Maladoma Somme. I quoted from him earlier from the biography that he had worked with James Hillman in the men's groups. And James had always said to me, he was in, very insistent that I had to talk to Maladoma. Not about Franklin, he just said, you know, that Maladoma was a very important figure in his life. And so I did, but only over the phone. But I called Maladoma, in, and, or not, I didn't call him, but I emailed and found out that he was going to be in Ojai, California and that we were going back to L.A. We divided our time between the East and, and West Coast. And uh, this is Melodoma. That's James Hillman. This is probably the early 1990s. And that's Melodoma standing next to him at that men's conference. And Michael Mead next to Melodoma. Mm. And, the, the, and the men's groups, by the way, I mean, there's a lot of stereotypes about them. And I write about them at length in volume two because they were an extraordinary thing that the media completely misconstrued and people don't really know what men went through together to become more of who they are. And many wives were saying, you know, hey, I wish to, <laughs> I'm so glad he did this because, you know, he came back a much more vulnerable person. But anyway, Michael Mead and, J and Robert Bly and James Hillman were teachers at many of these, and then Maladoma was, and there was one of them in the woods of West Virginia where they brought 50 black men and 50 white men together for a week to get into it. I write about it in volume two. It was an extraordinary week, and that's where James first met Maladoma, and Maladoma first told his story, which is that he, w he came from Burkina Faso in West Africa, and when he was about four, his father gave him up in his little village, he lived in a place called Dano, and gave him to the Jesuits. Christianity was trying to, you know, still making all these inroads into West Africa at the time, and the Jesuits raised Maladoma. And he escaped when he was 20 um, and made his way back somehow to his village, but arrived back there not speaking the language. Um, and, and really, like, you know, people, they, people didn't know what to do with him. They didn't want him back. But his grandfather had been a very well-known shaman and uh, was still alive at the time and saw that Maladoma had this mission. And the mission had to do with bridging the gap between the West and the indigenous world of Africa. And uh, he who becomes friends with the stranger, I think, was what, what the, the name that was given Maladoma. And he ended up being educated at the Sorbonne, going to Boston University, had never told his story until he went to this men's group. And, uh, and then he began, he's, he wrote a book called Of Water and the Spirit, which is a wonderful book, autobiogra autobiography, um, The Healing Wisdom of Africa, written several books, and um, became um, a very good friend of mine. I went to Ojai for a divination with him. That's the two of us um, in 2013. And what I went through with Maladoma was being assigned uh, well, what, 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 this is a divination pattern. So what you do is you take your, your strong hand, which in my case is the left. As a male, I move it clockwise, clockwise and until he tells you to stop. And it consists of all these objects, these ritual objects that he carries with him everywhere, which are, you know, bones and shells and you name it. He's got it in there, coins. And then around that you know, circular pattern, and then he, when he tells you to stop, he reads the pattern. And, and he can, from that, see a lot. And I had gone to see him specifically about Franklin. And, um, and I, I had two sessions with him, and it was quite amazing. But what he tuned into, one of the things he tuned into, was the fact that my ancestors did not know, they couldn't understand Franklin. They didn't, first of all, he was half black. Second of all, he had this so-called mental illness. And he said, and so they don't, they don't know who he is. He said, and, and you have got to get your ancestors to give him a place at the table. So I was assigned initially some rituals to do and that I went to the beach in Malibu. And, uh, um, and they involved you know, milk and, and apple cider vinegar and vodka, and then I had to walk and I would cast into seven waves, I would cast these, these things, and then I, I, I would have to walk with a, with a whole ear of corn and put the kernels along the shore and, and, um, and invoke 
a healing for my son and also invoke uh, my ancestors to talk to them. And then I did other rituals just trying to reach my, my ancestors. And um, so this went on for a while. And then eventually I took, I took Franklin to Jamaica. Uh, where Maladoma was uh, having a, a retreat with, with at, a, at a lovely place there on the shore, he fell totally fell in love with Jamaica, and got to know Maladoma, meet him there for the first time. And Maladoma said it was like meeting a colleague. And uh, as they talked, and Franklin did drawings for him, and I mean, it, it, it kind of blew Maladoma's mind. And uh, and they had quite an amazing um, session together that I also you know write about in the book and. Um, and Franklin's art, he began to do more art. Um, that's a, 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 a pastel, which is not that easy to do. A pastel of a face inspired, I think, by his, his meeting with Maladoma. And um, then he did this, which is, um, this was a few years ago. He called it soul at the top, and then had these yin and yang symbols at the bottom. And I had uh, continued to see Maladoma for divinations, and so did Franklin's mother, who um, we we have been separated, we'd been apart for many years, um, but we remained good friends. And she ended up doing a divination with Maladoma in, in Baltimore. And he he told us that eventually, uh, sooner rather than later, he wanted us to go to his village uh, in Burkina Faso, the three of us, if we could, and uh, and and meet with a healer there that he had that he really felt could could help Franklin more than he could. But there was something that I had to do first. And I'll give you a quote from James Hillman, who put it like this at one of the men's, men's conferences where he shared the podium with Maladoma. And he said, doing something for the dead was a big piece of these rituals. There was great emphasis on grief, on burning away resentments, on letting go. Men built little shrines and altars as part of this attempt to connect backward. We were trying to wash away, I would say, the personal baggage that people have. I often talked about the importance of the dead. Never mind your mother and father. Think about your grandparents and what you're really carrying. This is Jung's whole point in the Red Book. The dead want to teach us something. So I don't know that I'm going to have time to read this whole sh passage, but I do want to tell you, uh, I'll read some of it. Because what Maladoma um, assigned to me he said that I needed to be um, an architect, moderating a handshake, really, between two lines of ancestry in my son. He said, excavating to find those hidden truths that are useful to contributing to any lasting change. You will see that the rabbit hole is deep. The intervention is designed to bring a sense of belonging out of what, was, what currently remains an incomplete homecoming. I'm talking about repair of the past, the past that has become the embodiment that Franklin chose. Something needs to be cleansed, to be purified. Some reconciling needs to be made. For Franklin, the dual nature of his heritage is causing him to perhaps become the embodiment of the relational crisis that has historically become prevalent between these ancestors. This is something a sensitive being like him cannot avoid, simply because it's a radical gesture of honesty and integrity for him as an advanced spirit to be able to carry it, however painful, however difficult, however tormenting that will be. It's amazing that somebody can be such a cradle, as if he has the metabolic power to reconcile all this. He continues, the conflict has to do with the European grandiosity that calls itself the high culture, the one that knows everything, that knows better, and then the rest of the world, namely Africa, that knows nothing. It's suggested that you have a role to play, to help dissipate that, to be able to intervene in such a way that this point of contention is removed from the equation, thereby allowing a direct flow between two ancestries that are warring themselves within a person. I point to a stone at the edge of the circle and ask what it signifies. This is radical change, the snake zone that symbolizes radical change. Maladoma points to a small key facing toward the deep, deep orange ancestor stone near the middle of the circle, calling this a kind of access to the ancestral vault, part of the journey into the unknown. 
I gaze deep into the pattern before, spread out before me, mesmerized by the cluster of objects. The assorted stones and shells seem possessed by an internal vibrancy in the subdued light. My insides are churning. A part of me hasn't really wanted to hear this. A part of me has hoped that the ritual work both I and Etta, Frank's mother, have done is enough. Yet Maladoma is saying that this is all far from over, that indeed the effort has only begun. And another part of me feels ready for whatever the next step requires. A visit to Maladoma's village remains to be fulfilled. Had you been already to Dano, he is saying, you would have been subjected to certain kinds of rituals that would have ripped open the whole thing, and Franklin would have had a chance to be really, I don't know, amused by it. But first there's this incom un in uncomplete incompleteness, this unresolvedness. I'm not ignoring the fact that you've already been to Africa, but that part you still need to go, the western part, is as close to the origin of Franklin's ancestors as you can get. How to make it happen at what time is a practical organization that's totally different from the relevance of the whole concept we've been discussing. Maladoma looks one last time at the objects spread across the table. He points to some oval pieces of metal that have fallen intertwined. At first, I thought it was a horseshoe, he says. No such luck. It reminds Maladoma of a shackle, a slave shackle. Somehow, he says, I have to find one and throw it into the waves of the Atlantic somewhere in the middle passage where slaves from Africa crossed to meet their American owners. This gesture would speak to the ground beneath the water that links the two continents. I am stunned, speechless. I planned to go see Franklin on the East Coast by the end of May. That meant a window of about six weeks to commence my assignment, but how? I mulled this over for days afterward. Then I went on eBay. I typed in the words, slave shackles. An item popped up from somewhere in the Midwest. Heavy, wrought iron, hand forged, apparently worn around the ankles or legs during the period pre preceding the Civil War. The opening bid was $299. I placed it. I won the auction. When the box arrived at my Boston residence, I brought it down to my basement office and put it at the far end of my desk. There it lay. I couldn't bring myself to open it. Perhaps I would make a driving trip with Franklin to visit his mother in Baltimore. I called Etta. She had also just seen Maladoma for a divination. They talked of how she'd been unable to learn much about her ancestry. The names are not so important, Maladoma said, only the connection. Some of her ancestors she knew were freed slaves. Her mother's father came from Cambridge, Maryland on the eastern shore. Her father's father was from somewhere in Virginia. In my family, the Russells from England were said to have first settled in Virginia in colonial times. I told Etta about the ritual I'd been assigned and about obtaining the shackle. At first, she was speechless. Then she related something strange that had happened not long ago while she sat in the audience listening to a concert choir. Suddenly, she'd felt transported back to what she seemed to be a slave quarters, where a group of people huddled together singing. I heard the source, felt totally connected to my roots, to the place where the music came from, she told Melodoma. He'd replied, melody, melody was the only thing that sustained those who came here from Africa, and it's kept you alive. He also said, you know, Franklin is orchestrating this whole thing. If not for him, none of this would be happening. He created all these weavings. So we drove together, I won't read this little part, to uh, Baltimore. And um, Franklin and I talked on the way, we got to the house, um, and I had decided um, this is where I was gonna do it. I had the shackle in a box beside me in the car. Actually, it was then, I think it was still in my suitcase. And um, I thought, I'm gonna go to the Eastern Shore. Cambridge, Maryland is where Etta's ancestors had crossed a long time ago. And on the way, I thought I would try to find the birthplace of Frederick Douglass. I'd written about him in my book, Black Genius, and I knew he'd been born in this, on the eastern shore of Maryland. Etta said some, she'd sometimes thought how much Franklin resembled Douglass, who was himself of mixed parentage. So I set off uh, the next morning, and I went first to, uh, Douglas's birthplace is not where, where the tourist maps say it is. It's, it's in a different spot, and you have to do some research to find it, and it's actually on somebody's uh, homestead. And I drove on to that place, and they didn't want it. They just kind of, they were not friendly. So I left, 
and I went to Covey's Landing, which is where um, Douglas used to fish as a boy. And there was nobody there. And I had the shackle in the box beside me. And while I was sitting there at Covey's Landing, I opened it. And uh, it felt like the right place. And I set it down beside me in the passenger seat and I started the car again. So I went on to uh, Cambridge and the, I went to the Harriet Tubman Museum. She was born only 20 miles from Douglas. After her escape from slavery, she'd led hundreds of people to freedom along the Underground Railroad. With a few other visitors, I watched a 20 minute video about Tubman's remarkable life. And then I noticed a single plaque on the wall of the museum. After the video ended, I was drawn to see what it said. Inside a frame was a memento from the slavery era, a $200 award being offered for the return of a family who had escaped. The year was 1847, the place St. Louis. The father's name was Washington. The wife and two children were listed simply as mulatto. The reward notice was signed by William Russell. Mm -hmm. Although my genealogical research had never come across anything about such a surname from that time or place, I was stunned and shaken. I turned away and walked to the front desk of the museum. I learned that before 1808, I asked for some of the history of Cambridge. Long Wharf, which was very nearby, had been the primary port of entry for thousands of slaves being brought from West Africa to Maryland. Since Maryland was not a slave state per se, this had been legally stopped, but the numbers continued to increase through the Civil War. I asked for a local phone book. I went outside and looked up the name Sampson. That was Etta's ancestors' names. There were dozens. I made a few calls from my cell phone, failing to find one, find out anything about Etta's direct relations. I did speak, however, to a 91-year-old woman named Pensacola, who informed me that her great-great-grandmother had been a slave with three children. It was a beautiful spring afternoon in the mid-70s. I drove a half mile to Long Wharf and parked. The Pride of Baltimore, a replica of a clipper ship from the early 1800s, was just docking. About 30 people got off. According to a crew member, the ship took groups of tourists on two-hour cruises out into the Choptank River and toward the entry to the Chesapeake Bay. So I thought that's it. I bought the last ticket for the two o'clock departure the next day and I found a motel room for the night. I called Alice and told her the story of my day, including the reward signed by William Russell. The shackle guy, she said. I realized that the shackle had been shipped to me from the Midwest, where ancestors on my father's side had lived, so this was not in, out of the realm of possibility. Watching TV afterward, I noticed that the moment I made the call to Alice, my watch had stopped. My oldest possession, a gift from my parents on my 10th birthday. At first, when I wound it, the watch wouldn't start running again. But after a few minutes, it did. Very strange, I thought to myself. Mid-morning on a Sunday, in my motel room, I reread my divination with Maladomo, where he assigned the ritual with the shackle. I tried again to reach him without success. Then I brought the shackle out and held it in my hands. Tears welled up in my eyes. I went back to reading a book called One Drop of Blood about the history of race relations in America. I read online about a Henry Russell who was killed by the Indians with his colored slave while traveling alongside Daniel Boone's son James at Wallens Creek in Powell's River, Virginia, early in the 19th century. I seemed caught in a time warp. A later Russell in my own lineage was named Henry. A time warp held powerful emotions whose specific cause was not fathomable. I believed in karma, not just personal, but ancestral. What was I carrying and what was Franklin carrying from my forebears? Could I really do something about it? I'd never felt anything quite like this. My strange meditative morning drew to a close. As I went to check out of the motel, the TV in the lobby was tuned to CNN. The guest was ta Coates, who had just published a cover article in the latest Atlantic. It was called The Case for Reparations for Slavery and Its Ongoing Legacy. Until we reckon with our compounding moral debts, America will never be whole, the article's subtitle said. I went to a store and bought some milk for a post-sailing ritual also assigned by Maladoma. I stood on the dock at the edge of Long Wharf, the shackle in my hands, speaking to the vivid mental images of my ancestors and then to the water spirit. I also silently addressed the landing of slaves on this dock, including Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, and Etta's maternal ancestors. 
The Clipper topsail schooner made famous for its success during the War of 1812 lay anchored nearby. Tourists were already boarding. The only objects inside the black shoulder bag where I usually kept my computer were the container of milk and the shackle. I tried not to betray my nervousness as I handed my ticket to one of the crew of the Pride of Baltimore. It was a windless warm afternoon. The voyage took longer than anticipated. A small craft sent out a distress signal when its engine conked out, and our vessel paused to launch a kayak and come to their rescue. The tourists on board the Pride milled around impatiently as my nervousness increased. I tried to envision where I might bring forth the shackle from my bag without being observed by anyone. With some 30 people on board, this would not be an easy feat. I looked around. The schooner had 10 sails, including a large one on a boom and a main topsail. Perhaps I could find a spot somewhere toward the bow, away from the crowd, and wedging myself in between the guardrail and a smaller sail extending downward from the main boom. We were about an hour into the trip when I made my way forward to the port side. We'd entered the open water of the Chesapeake. Yes, it was time. I unzipped my bag, reached in, and grabbed the shackle. I threw it overboard. Take it, water spirit, I whispered. The splash resounded, or so it seemed to my ears. But as I turned around again, no one appeared to have noticed. My action had somehow been invisible. As a surge of relief swept over me, again, tears came to my eyes. After this, we were ready to go to West Africa, where Maladoma wanted us to see his own holy men. And in January 2016, a little over two years ago, we did. That's Franklin at the beginning of the trip. We were lucky enough, our, our plane got delayed, so we had a, a day, actually each way, to see Istanbul, where the plane stopped. And so that's inside the Hagi Sophia Cathedral. And you can see, though, on Franklin's face, something of apprehension. He's not quite sure about what's going on. I'll show you what happened in between, but that's him at the end of the trip, back in his apartment in Cambridge. Big change, huge change. That's the holy man. He was part Muslim, part indigenous. And nobody knew how old he was. And with a group of other Westerners that were there with Maladoma was with us too, we attended his services. And we took African medicine in this very, very small village outside of a place called Bobo. He was an amazing looking man. I mean, that's, he wore these, he changed his robes every day. And, uh, and he, he, he loved Franklin. And he really thought uh, he could help him, and he did. And we each were assigned, we had, each of us had a pot. Um, with, and those are roots at the top of the pot that are, I don't know what they were. I mean, they were native to that area. And there was water in the bottom. And every day we would change the water. And what we had to do was twice a day we would, we would drink uh, from this pot. Um, and then we would also put some water on us and bathe in it, you know, just privately. But we, we did a ritual together where we shared the, we shared the drink. And... Um, you know, there was something about being there as a family in this situation that was really incredible. And it was not easy. I mean, there were, there were some, there was some really tough days, exhausting days. We were traveling between these villages and, and taking this medicine. And um, that's Franklin and me sitting in the, waiting to see the holy man one day. His mom took that picture. I love that picture. Um, and there's his mom riding on the back of a guy's motorbike one day in the little village where Maladoma lived, where we also traveled to. He <laughs> looks a little scared, too, but nothing happened. He was an artist, and he, he took Franklin under his wing, and they did art together. And, and um, he started with, uh, we decided while we were there that we would, we would start going off his medication. He wanted to do it. He wanted to give it a try. We didn't do it quickly, uh, but we didn't have his doctor's permission. And by the end of the trip, after we'd been we'd doing this for a while, um, he, he was uh, very paranoid about 
the fact that when he got back home, the doctor might just throw him back in a hospital because he'd gone off some of his meds. So we had to really fight through that, and it was very difficult, and a lot of stuff came out that he'd gone through in hospitals that we never knew. Uh, had no idea. One time he was, he was a year in a hospital. It was really tough, and he was young, younger. And um, but the the culmination, um, which again relates to to James Hillman, it's a short passage. Um, we we went through uh, some animal rituals, animal sacrifice, I guess you'd say. And um, I wrote this part about a, a very sacred ritual that we went through toward the end. It, had always, it, it has always been there, always held a divinity. Sacrifice is the oldest form of religious act, writes German professor Herbert Kuhn. When the Egyptians worshipped the bull, writes archetypal psychologist James Hillman, then it was not simply a fertility divinity of life, but the fecundity of imagination that kept all gods alive. It is imbued in many creation myths. In Persia, from a bull named Fosh, emanate all things of the world. In Hindu mythology, Nandi the bull is the bearer of truth and righteousness. Zeus took the form of a glorious white bull and spirited Europa across the sea to the island of Crete. Dionysus is the noble bull, his celebrants also bedecked with horns. On the wall of the Lascaux cave in France, all painting begins with a huge bull bearing traces of numerous other animals along its body. The first letter of the original alphabet is Aleph, A-L-E-P-H, Hebrew and Semitic and Arabic. Alpha in Greek. Alpha, Aleph was derived from a glyph depicting the face of a bull. In our words, elephant and alphabet contain that ancient meaning. The majestic beast, the first word, Aleph and the bull. The Greek prefix bou, B-O-U, our bovine, refers to vast transcendent power. As Hillman writes in his 1981 essay, Imagination is Bull, some scholars trace the origin of money to the ceremonial dismemberment of the bull in ancient Greece. The spit on which the animal was roasted, obolos, became the coin, obolos, as the piece of bull meat stuck to the spit. Bull sacrifices were the first form of taxes, and the treasuries of temples originate in the closed places where sacrificial bulls were kept. The ancient Roman currency, the ass, means piece of roast. The ancient Spartan iron coin originates in the sickle-shaped knife used to kill the sacrificial bull. In the mythology of Egypt, the civilization that Franklin so often referenced in words and hieroglyphic style art, the baby bull is born declaring itself to be the bull of confusion. In the Old Testament, Aaron's sons sprinkle the blood of a bullock onto the altar and offer a burnt sacrifice to the Lord, Leviticus 1, 5 to 9. But with the death and resurrection of Christ, such animal rituals largely ceased. And bull worship, remember the golden calf, became considered the Hebrew people's greatest biblical sin. Following the overthrow of Mithraism and the simultaneous triumph of Christianity, writes A. Fraser in The Bull, 1972, the bull faded away into the realms of surreptitious superstition and the secret pagan practices of peasantries, but had no place in the Christian church nor in Christian art. Both in West and East, the religions of Christianity and of Islam have pushed all pictorial representations of the bull either into the bull ring or onto the farm. In the mythology handed down to our time, the bull foremost becomes an object of fear. The dreadful bull-headed minotaur imprisoned in its labyrinth and feeding upon beautiful young men and women until Theseus finally slays it. And of what must be overcome by brute strength, Hercules battling the bull of Crete. As Hillman ponders, in America's conquering of the Native Americans and the West, we wiped out the native bison, the horned bull of this land. Could it be that the slaughter of the soil's totem is a blood crime, a pollution of the American soul? Murder of the ancestral animal, a mythical genocide that made mythic perception no longer possible, a genocide backed by Hercules, Mithra, Gilgamesh, and the ancient struggle at the foot of Sinai, the Bible's word against the pagan bull. Suppose the archaic bull spirit could be summoned here in these western lands that, like the Mediterranean, are territory of the bull. We had a bull die for us in Burkina Faso. 
and it was one of the most moving experiences I've ever been through. I remember putting my hand on it. We all stood there. We prayed over it. It was as if the animal knew that it was giving its life for us and for what the holy man could see about uh, how this would affect my son. And uh, it was truly amazing. We came back to this country, and um, Franklin, um, as I said, was going off his medication. This is him returning to his apartment in Cambridge. Oh, I love that picture too, I took it actually. Mm -hmm. Sitting there sort of in shadow and, and uh, working on his art. That's, I think, an amazing piece. That's the interior he drew of an automobile from the inside out. I mean, it's, it's, it just blew me away. He loves mechanical, you know, objects, and he's often drawing them, but to put that together of what, the, what a car looks like to him from the inside really kind of mm -hmm. stunned me. Another piece that he was doing after he came back from West Africa. And then uh, for a year, more than a year, um, he gradually, gradually went off uh, all his medication. And he was okay. But then last summer, about a year ago now, when the Medicaid went finally, and I wouldn't, I, his doctor did this without asking his mom and me, and we are his co-legal guardians. He, when, the blood, when the medication finally left his system altogether, he soared out there, had a huge uh, crash. And uh, it was really scary. I mean, it was a month where, again, back in the complete unknown, not knowing anything, what was gonna happen, um, we went on the road, and uh, Maladoma was in Florida at the time where he lives when he's not traveling all over, all over the place. And so we went to Maladoma's home and he had Franklin uh, do uh, work with clay and uh, make things out of clay. And then he had a tree, a very a sacred tree in his yard and uh, put a mask at the, uh, at the foot of the tree. I think it was an oak, I can't remember exactly right now. And then, uh, had Franklin placed this there, and that's a, it's, a, it's a contomble. And in the Dagara culture of, that Maladoma comes from, they have, the contomble are the little people. I mean, there are little people in many cultures, you know, they're the leprechauns in Ireland or whatever, but the contomble live in, in the mountains and uh, are, are these sacred beings that uh, come from another world. And uh, so that was put there again to, to help Franklin through this and uh, to help they're, they're there to help we more, you know, uh, help the mortals find their way in this, in this world. And, um, and so after going through all this and spending yet another month in a hospital in, at Johns Hopkins, um, Franklin came out. He has moved in with his mom in Baltimore. And I've come to realize that, you know, he was so alone, except for when I'd visit him or his mom would visit him in, in uh, the, a group home in Massachusetts. And just, you know, alone with his thoughts, uh, alone to, he, he was still creating, but um, it was definitely not the best thing for him. And with his mom, who has a whole world, she's a music teacher and a musician that she lives uh, in Baltimore and her, she lost her husband a couple of years ago. And so uh, they're very happy. And Franklin is going to a day program and he has a job in a library at Johns Hopkins and, and he is no longer delusional at all. Mm. He does not draw these strange symbols that he used to draw that I think he was channeling from somewhere and he doesn't he doesn't talk in the same way that he's done all these things already and you know he's he's uh, the transform and so I, I look at it like the whole experience and you know, starting with what James Hillman gave us uh, and then through these trips to Africa we're really part of a process that you know is not over yet he's 39 now um, and uh, he's still doing art, and his art is changing. Mm -hmm. That's what he what, a piece that he did this spring. I think we're going to have try to have a show for him, um, mm -hmm. in uh, or at least uh, he's put some of his pieces in a store. And that's I love that one because he, he's starting to really work with different colors, and that of course is a is a plane that's also a bird. And um, 
So much has continued to emerge and very briefly, uh, and then I'm gonna open this up for questions. Um, uh, much continued to emerge for me too. Um, and I, this is a kid that I mentored. Uh, he was here actually at the Pacifica party last summer. His name is Romeo. And it's too long a story for me to tell tonight, but I took him, that's him with Maladoma. I took him to see Maladoma too. I met him at a, one night at a meeting called Echo in, here in LA that the Youth Mentoring Connection has. Once a month, I got there, went there by accident. Um, guy said, oh, we have these meetings of these inner city kids, black and brown kids, and they come together and they talk about the, all the things they're going through in their lives. And if you want to come, we have mentors there and you might find it interesting. So I went. And that, that kid was 17 and uh, they started with Homer's Odyssey. Uh, the guy who runs it as a way for kids to relate to their lives because the word mentor comes from uh, the Odyssey, sirens come from the Odyssey. And he got to a point in the story where they're on the ship, uh, Odysseus is on the ship, and, uh, and he stopped and he said, can anybody in this room tell me what happens next? And this kid started telling the whole rest of the Odyssey. Wow. And people are going, well, I was, wow, that's an interesting kid. And he revealed later that night that he uh, had, um, he was always in trouble in when he was in juvenile detention and um, so he, they started making him read the dictionary and he discovered that he not only loved to read but he loved the myths he said and I know all the myths mm -hmm. so we kind of connected through the rest of that night it turned out his mother is bipolar when I mentioned Franklin and and um, anyway I, a long story very short um, I ended up contacting him again. I didn't even know his last name, but I went home and a friend said, hey, maybe, you know, the Getty Villa has all these Greek and Roman sculpture rooms. Maybe that kid would like to see those. So I ended up contacting Romeo and I told him, I said, if you don't think it's weird, I said, I would, I would take you and your, your girlfriend or your friend, you know, whoever you want to take, we can go to this place one day. And he said, well, that sounds nice. So uh, one morning for the first time in my life, I drove into South Central LA and pulled up in front of this house, and uh, he wasn't there at first. I went in and talked to his, his, his sitting out there in the car, and I call, and his woman answers, turns out to be his grandmother, and she says, well, Romeo, he's not here. And I said, well, you know, it's, I'm supposed to take him somewhere in 10 minutes. Uh, she says, well, he might come back. Yeah, he told me he might be coming. I said, well, should I just uh, wait here in the car? She says, oh, no, I think you better come in. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I went in and hung out with her, and she said, you know, it's nice you're here. She said, he. He doesn't really have a father. His father's in jail. His mother's on drugs in Vegas. And you know, I'm trying to get him to finish school. And she said, he's really smart, you know. I said, yeah, I know. So anyway, he, hands, he shows up with his uh, friend, Damage, and, and a girl. And we, and we drive off toward Malibu. And we, I learn on the way that these kids, uh, Romeo grew up in Vegas some, but he, they've, never, they've never seen the ocean. They've never been out of that. He's never been to a zoo. These kids have never been out of that neighborhood. And so it was really eye-opening for me. And we get, we get to the Getty Villa, and all Romeo wants to see, we pull up to this incredible place, right? And all, all Romeo wants to see are these rooms. We walk into the first room, and he looks at the statue, which, as I recall, was Aphrodite. And he turns and looks at me, starts telling me the whole story, who all the gods were, who they were related to, everything about it. And this kid did that for two and a half hours every single thing we saw. And he, we had people following us around the museum like he was a tour guide. <laughs> and uh, so that was the beginning of, we, and we, we uh, so, and he was funny too. I remember we got to this one booth, and, or one glass case, and he looks and, it's, and he says, it's got some Greek queen. He says, ah, he's bedecked in jewels. He said, you can tell those Greek queens were really narcissistic. <laughs> And so, so we've got, and so people are following us around and laughing, and and uh, and the other kid is he's into it. Too. They defer to Romeo because he's the one who really knows the myths, but they're 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 into it too. And and uh, so I, I start telling stories about when I was traveling, you know, years ago in Africa, and how I spent the snuck up there and I slept at the feet of the Sphinx and climbed the Great Pyramid in the morning before anybody saw me. And Damaji looks at me and says, "Did you feel the alien energy?" <laughs> So we're on our way out, and I tell these three kids that uh, they can go. Let's go to the bookstore, and I'll get you whatever. One of each, each of you, one, one book that you pick out. So Romeo, of course, gets the Greek myths by Robert Graves, and Dimaggio gets the secret history of the world, and the girl gets Cleopatra. And we get back in the car, and Dimaggio is in the back seat. He's a Hispanic kid, and he says, "Yeah, he says there were some really nice-looking people in there." He says, "Dick, did you see some of those people looking at you like, where did you steal these children?" <laughs> 
<laughs> so, I mean, you, I mean, I mean, I'm just loving it too, right? And so I, they've never been to the ocean, so I take them to lunch at, uh, at Duke's on the Malibu Pier, and. Uh, and it's Mother's Day, so I can't get us. Uh, all the tables are taken. I forgot it's mother, forgot it was Mother's Day, but I I just grab us a table, and the waitress says, "Well, you know, can you be out of here by three? I said, "Yeah, we can." So their kids go into the buffet line, and you know they're having mussels and roast beef and crazy, right? And, and uh, at the and at the end of the lunch, Romeo looks at me and says, "Hey, Dick, you think we could do takeout?" <laughs> <laughs> so the water waiter comes over and. Uh, and I, he looks at this, the situation and he sizes the table up and he says, I'm not supposed to do this. He brings three takeout boxes and the kids go back and pile their plates as high as they can. So they take home some food to grandma, right? And so we get back in the car and we see somebody smoking weed on the way out. And so then, you know, they start talking about weed and we start just hanging out and they, they want to know everything about me now. So I tell them my experiences in Africa and smoking dope with the pygmies and you know all kinds of good stories. And and we when we get back to the house and to the hood and and uh, get out of the car and Tamaji says I woke up this morning thinking this was going to be a really good day, but I had no idea it'd ever be anything like this. And that was the beginning of an amazing life-changing really relationship for me where it was what was really uh, fascinating and, and strange was how F Franklin and Romeo never met but they seemed to know each other and they would talk about each other and they would you know and, and they talked on the phone a couple of times and it was it was a very mysterious thing and uh, eventually and I went through all kinds of experiences with these kids I mean risky things Took them out of L.A. once when I knew they didn't do something they were accused of. Um, and bailed Romeo out of jail when he did something based on that that he was accused of. And we got to be really tight. Um, and then um, Romeo liked to write and he loved the myths. And so I, I ended up talking to Craig Chalquist at Pacifica and um, who's starting this mythological journal called uh, Eminence. And he said, well, I was telling him about Romeo. He says, can he write? I said, yeah, I think maybe he can. And so he said, well, if he wants to write a piece for the first issue, I'll publish it, and I'll pay, give him all the proceeds from the first issue. So that's he did. And uh, did a whole story on how mythology changed his life and uh, shaped his life. And it was published in the first issue of Eminence. And then that led to um, Pacifica being interested in, in uh, I brought Romeo up there to meet Steve Eisenstadt. And, uh, <laughs> and and Eisenstadt was really pretty blown away by him. I mean, Romeo wore a suit. You know, we got him a suit, and he was all he was all decked out. That's Romeo in the in, in the Campbell Library, which he just you know he, Joseph Campbell was like he read the hero's journey when he was in a a detention camp, not detention camp, but in a, in a, you know, one of those camps for juveniles when he did something in, in the Nevada and they, they send you into the wilderness and you have to learn how to survive. Uh, you know, you're, you have people with you to make sure you do, but, you know, learn how to survive over a period of six weeks, I think. And so he, he just was reading Campbell's Hero's Journey. And so for him to be in the Campbell room was really quite a, quite a thing for him. And then, uh, and he just loved Pacific. He wants to go there someday and, and uh, be part of that. And, uh, and then he came up there. I, I was moderating a panel on storytelling uh, about a year ago right now with Theon Gordon and Craig Chalkwist. And Romeo was the third person on the panel. And we had a 100 people in that room. And I tell you, that kid blew him away. I mean, he talked so eloquently and described his experience in getting thrown into jail one time for absolutely nothing because he didn't have his ID on him. Spending three days in hardcore jail, you know, downtown L.A. and told this story of what he went through and what it was like in there. And I mean, people were like, oh, my God. So anyway, it's been quite a relationship with him. And um, he came here last summer. We're still real close, uh, but he's in, back in Vegas right now, living with his mom, and uh, it's difficult because he has a child, actually, he has now two children, and he's only 20 years old, and the foster system has one, and his ex-girlfriend has another, and it's a really tough, tough world, and I've learned 
things I had no idea what it was really like, you know, living, surviving, really. I mean, he changed. I mean, he had he'd lived for his entire life on the streets. You know, he'd been homeless a lot before I met him. I mean, he just, he just robbed people. And uh, he doesn't do it anymore. And uh, he's turned a corner, and I just hope, you know, that he'll be able to go to Pacifica someday. And we'll just have to have to see. But um, so that's a, getting close to the end here, and then I'll open it up. But um, Kwame Scruggs, um, who went to Pacifica and uh, has a program in Ohio which uses myth uh, to uh, called alchemy to work with uh, inner city kids. It's an after-school program, and it has transformed. There's an incredible film about it. About it, he's amazing, Kwame, and he he wanted to meet Romeo, so I introduced them, and he's been very involved as, with Romeo too. And uh, but he, that's him on the left um, with Orland Bishop, who I also met through <coughs> indirectly. Well, he knew James Hillman, and. Uh, and was close to Maladoma. And Orland is an amazing guy who lives in, he orchestrated the truce between the Crips and the Bloods back in the 90s. Um, he's a spiritual leader without being tied to any particular religion. And with him, my wife and I are very involved in getting a, a Waldorf uh, type school uh, initiative uh, public charter going in Watts. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're engaged in that right now. That's Orland with a a kid in uh, in Oakland. They have, Oakland has a has an existing um, charter school in the inner city, a Waldorf model, and it's it's really successful. And so that's been part of what we're what we're modeling on. And um, yeah, just a quote from Orland as, as I near the end here. It's it's um, it's from the volume second volume of my book and a chapter I call Creating Ritual Space, and it's it's about the men's groups. Orland Bishop, who went on to create the Shade Tree Multicultural Foundation in Los Angeles, attended these men's groups for 20 years as both a teacher and participant and reflected, in that kind of space, it's an initiation. They created that kind of tension, five days of ritual making where you actually go through years of unresolved locked thinking. Anything could happen going towards some threshold of soul. It's about freeing the will from repetition. You cross all the breaking points and just surrender to what is inevitable the descent into the uncertainty, and then you make a ritual. I thank you. So, so I'll, I'll um, open it up for questions after we're, we're done. I have copies of some copies. I, I think I have five copies of the Hillman Volume One and some copies of My Mysterious Son. If any of you are interested, I'll, I'll, you can buy them from me at a discount. And um, also, I have some information about the Waldorf School if you're interested in that. Do you want to go until nine fifteen or until nine? Just so I know as we get grooving in here. The um, the ritual timer will go off at 8:55. Got it. Uh, I can, I can, I can, I can change that. But I think we could get, you know, a, st a technical start. Started about 10 minutes later. Yeah. So why don't we go to 9:15? Okay. Are we okay going to 9:15? Yeah. You know? Only if you want to stick around. <laughs> I mean, um, I like the ritual opening and ending to it. Mm -hmm. Well, so you covered so much, so much space, and you uh, continued to change, uh, uh, in some ways, even the topic of, of conversation. So um, I'm sure that the conversations, the questions, will range back through the whole, whole discussion. Um, and so I just wanted to jump in with a couple things before asking this group. And and this is just a totally, totally uh, uh, slight curveball of a question, but. Uh, did either of what what do your two uh, your your two mysterious sons think of Black Panther, especially your son? 
Because it's really that. Yeah, it. You know, Black Panther is an amazing movie. Yeah. I mean, it is so deep. It is so beyond what it appears to be. You know, on the surface mm -hmm. of just this you know, kind of sci-fi. How many of you seen Black Panther? Okay. I don't know if we can talk about it, but uh, I, I just, my, my wife and I were just blown away by it. A lot of our friends weren't. I mean, they kind of, we watched it together and they, they didn't see it quite in the same mysterious way that we did because it was, it's a, it's a lot about the, not the past as well as the future. Mm -hmm. And Franklin loved it. I was wondering, yeah. Yeah, he, he, and so did Romeo. They both saw it. And um, yeah, Frank, that was the first movie Franklin had gone to see, I think, in, in a theater in, a, in years. Really? Wow. Yeah, and because uh, we, we went to movies when he was younger, after he had his breakdown, but we, we hadn't been to much lately. And uh, um, yeah, but he, he, he went with a couple of, uh, of his mom's friends and, and just thought it was <coughs> incredible. And Roman and I really didn't have it. Well, he's, he'd, he was gone, so we didn't really have a chance to talk about it. But he said, oh, yeah, you know. That but it was, came up with, yeah. So it, the one of the things that made me think of it, of course, is that scene at the end, you know, uh, when, because the whole movie is, uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, the whole movie is a tension between these two lines of perspective, you know, should should uh, these African uh, 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 culture, this hidden African culture, integrate into the modern world, mm -hmm. or should they stay recluded, uh, or should they, you know, take their reparations by force, or should it, and so it really was a lot of these conversations, some of the conversations that I could imagine that for somebody that is uh, biracial, not just biologically, but somebody who's actually carrying the weight of some of the psychological tension of both. Yeah. Know, that, that movie really teased out a lot of it. And then, uh, a spoiler, so cover your ears if you want, but the, one of the climactic moments, the end of the movie, had everything to do with, with scattering his ashes uh, in the water. Uh, and yeah. the, the way that you threw the shackle. Yeah, uh, and so yeah. I, was, I actually hadn't put that together quite in the same way, but it's, it was so strong. I mean, just uh, yeah, it kind of put a punctuation on the story being in some ways about that. I was so drawn to that part of your conversation. Mm. You know, you one thing that uh, <laughs> made it hard to sit up front in front of the camera was part when you were talking about the, the shackle, and one of the things that just stuns me to the end. It's very very cool. Is that that shackle had already been carried to the north. And however that shackle got to the north, it was by somebody who had freed themselves. Hmm. And hmm. so to me, that was just... An that's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, that's... Yeah. I, I didn't want to... I don't want to... I don't know what else there is to say about that, but it just stunned me that the significance of the fact that that shackle had already been from someone who yeah. freed themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other thing that was so interesting to me is you connected, uh, you talked about the chronic and Kronos. Kronos, yeah. So what about that moment when the... When my watch stopped? Did it give you hope that the chronic was... Yeah, you know, it was, well, it was like, well, this is the watch. It's been on my wrist since I was 10. Wow. It's been all over the world with me. It's a, it's a Hilton 17 Jewel winding watch. And... Uh, you know, I've had it obviously repaired a few times. It hasn't kept running all these years, but um, but it's my oldest possession that I have, and that means you know. I mean, once I was in in the middle of the Sahara Desert hitchhiking when I was in my twenties, and that's a whole other story. Crazy hitchhike across the desert, but um, and we were, and we were we'd run out of water, and we were at a at this away watering hole, little tiny place in the middle of nowhere, and this this nomad in a, literally the most primitive looking person I'd ever seen pointed to my watch and he said he wouldn't draw us water unless I gave him the watch basically and I wouldn't give him the watch hmm. so he drew it for me for us anyway hmm. but uh, so the watch, watch has been through a lot with me but so when it stopped that day at that particular moment it was just well it was part of this whole yeah. thing that I was in and it was like time had stopped I love in, the, in Pinocchio, I use it as, an, I teach story to, I teach myth to storytellers. And so I, you know, talk about the threat crossing the threshold. And one of my favorite moments is in Pinocchio, all the clocks go crazy mm. before the fairy comes. And it's, and I've started to see it in tons of stories where they use the clocks yeah. going crazy as yeah. a way to describe you, you are now in a yeah. non-normal, out of normal time. Right. Uh, incredible display. Yeah. Yeah. It's so true. And then, because, and then I wound it, you know, I always wind it, right? Just mm -hmm. keep it going. I wind it every day and it wouldn't start and it was like oh okay whatever's going on here <laughs> and then it finally it did eventually but uh, 
I was in a zone. I, I knew I was in a world that I was scared. I was, uh, I, literally, I was holding that shackle in my hands before I went out there, and, and I was crying. I mean, and I, I, I was shaking. I was like, I was so, you know, shaken by this, this experience. And, uh, and not, it was just beyond my understanding. And I, but, you know, looking back on it now, what happened to me after that, see, I don't, I don't know that, um, I don't think I would have found, I don't think I would have been drawn to that meeting and found Romeo if I hadn't had that, if I hadn't gone through that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I felt like a door opened that, uh, you know, what do they say, doors open too heavy to close. I mean, it was like, mm -hmm. it was, uh, it was something, something karmic and something part of my destiny that that boy then carried and that world carried that I had to, I had to enter and find out about and, and make some sacrifices in, you know, and, and take risks in. I mean, some of my, I didn't tell anybody some of the stuff I, I did with these kids. You know, it wasn't illegal. I mean, technically it might have been illegal because, but it, but it wasn't like they'd done anything terrible that I was taking them away from. But still, I mean, you know, it was a risky thing for, this old white guy to do. And well, I'm super stunned with the way, I mean, in talking about the other world, the way how, how real you made a journey into the ancestors' world in this time. That, that to me is stunning and actually really helped me shed light on some of my own experiences. Uh, I, I, had, uh, I started having seizures when I was 17, and I also struggled with my doctors wanting me to be on medication, wanting mm. to come off of my medication, uh, coming off my medication and being good and being scared that if I told the doctor I was off it, they'd make me go back on it, they'd, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I can say that also, you know, I think back on a specific moment uh, uh, that actually was what, what enabled me to heal myself throughout the whole time, a specific whispered words, be still. Hmm. Uh, that, that as I found years later turned out to be uh, my grandmother used to say it all the time to her huh. daughters Wow! and uh, so despite this, this struggle with western medicine that really didn't work for me very well uh, it seemed that my whole process uh, unfolded in a way that was organic and related to you know maybe my ancestry Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that kind of unfolding and, and I hadn't really put that, that kind of uh, shading on it until the story. So I wanted to uh, before hmm. oh, well, opening up to the rest, share and then oh, thank you for that. Oh well, thank you. That's 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 why I remember yeah. hearing Hillman go off on the pharmaceutical industry one time, mm. Mm. where he was talking about I'll use the word conspiracy between uh, corporate medicine, mm -hmm. the insurance companies, and the employment sectors that are sort of keeping everybody at a certain level of medication. Yeah. Yeah. And and he he was very eloquent in his in taking that whole uh, relationship to task on it. Did you ever talk with him about any of that? Not directly about the pharmaceutical industry, but um, I did oh, I think I told him what I was yes, I did. I told him what I was doing because you know like most parents in that situation, I was pretty clueless for a long time and just went along with what we were told he, Franklin, needed to do. One of the medications he was on, uh, and I did talk with James about this, uh, was Zyprexa. And in, in particular, that medication that's an antipsychotic puts tremendous weight gain on, on the people. And uh, in Franklin's case, at that point in time, he's not that heavy now, he lost a lot of weight, but uh, he, he ballooned up like by, a, he weighed almost 280 pounds or something. And, and he'd been a, you know, regular sized person. And, and it was Cyprexa that was doing it. And I read this series of articles in the New York Times about how this company, Eli Lilly was the company, and they knew damn well what this medication did. And they knew that it caused diabetes, which Franklin had for a little while, doesn't anymore. And you know, I was just in a rage about it. And fat cells reinforce depression because they create uh, estrogen. What's it called? Leptin. 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 Yeah. Yeah. And so they're willing to pass on those side effects <laughs> knowingly. Yeah, knowingly. And 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 so I I looked around. And I found a class action suit, and and I got Franklin into it, and he ended up getting fifteen thousand hmm. um, dollars. Which, you know, because it was just so wrong. And now, of course, these companies um, have, there's a book called Farmageddon, which is <laughs> about this subject. And there's another one, too. Uh, I can't think of the name of it right now. But, but um, 
Yeah, I mean, and now they're they're getting younger and younger kids. Mm -hmm. You know, to down to the age of five on antipsychotic medications, as if oh, as, as if they're you know they're, they're schizophrenic or something, and and that that is that is crazy. Mm -hmm. But it's a huge money maker, and. Uh, and you know, parents, you know, they don't know how to deal with kids who are ADHD or whatever, you know, and and um, and there's the rise of autism, of course, is huge in our society and is linked to environmental factors. I believe, I, I know, and um, so yeah, and I mean, it's it, the, the pharmaceutical industry is is really in this with all these kinds of uh, atypical psych antipsychotic atypicals, they call them or whatever. I mean. They're, they're really evil. I, they really are. Did Hillman have any pet um, non-profit or cultural uh, passions? Like environmentalism? He, or he was happened? very, yeah, he was very uh, into, into uh, he, he, would, uh, he was fighting a sewer line in his hometown in, in <laughs> Connecticut. Um, he had a big, what's it's called... Symbolically amazing. Yeah, isn't it's it? It's hilarious. Well. Yeah, and that was one of the, when I first met him, he told, us, told me about this, and then I got this friend of mine with the EPA, because I'd written about environmental issues for years, to, uh, to contact him and, and help out. Uh, but yeah, he was... Uh, he was a strong in, environmentalist, and his whole turn to the world, which is, they call anima mundi, uh, which happened in the early 1980s, um, that was when Hillman took a step away from strict, you know, depth psychology issues and like even such as therapy. And, and well, he was very critical of therapy too, the way it's practiced. But you know, and really getting into what the world around us, architecture, and and did did a whole series for the BBC on on architecture and and um, you know various uh, just you know how people had to get away from their personal problems and get involved in what was going on around them and see it and and uh, and try to connect with others in their community and fight for a better world yes you know I couldn't help but um, look at the similarity between your relationship with your son and Joyce and his daughter mm. who was also an artist she was a dancer mm -hmm. but at some point and not knowing why he allowed her to be put into a facility yeah. forever. I remember that. Whereas, and I'm not knocking him in any sense. Right. I don't know what he was walking in terms of his shoes. Right. But you seem to refuse to do that. You know, you didn't want that to happen. You felt, in my sense, that that disconnection was going to be, you know, not the way to go. But what also came up on mind is that did you, during this period of time, ever come across Stanislav Graf? At all? Um, I know who he is, uh, and, and I have never met him, but I've... Uh, and I know, so I've worked with him, and I've done this holotropic breath work. He would have considered your son's situation a spiritual emergency. Yeah. And that the drugs were basically just pushing it down. Yeah, well, early, and it was true. going to explode again. He's totally against pharmaceuticals. Really. Yeah, yeah. But he also has very shamanic learnings, and he would have been a wonderful, in my sense, mm. person for you to have been mm -hmm. to connect with and, yeah. you know, at some point there. Yeah. And I don't know if anything ever happens again, but... You know, it, to me, that's exactly why he went. He was the last person allowed to use LSD at Spring Grove State Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland. Right. right. Before he made the determination to go over to the there, There's, yes, there's a new book out, which I recommend, which is uh, uh, called um, How to Change Your Mind. Ah, oh, it's on the desk of somebody in my office right now. Michael Pollan. Mm -hmm. Michael Pollan. Keller was telling me. Oh, is that? Read it. Yeah. He, it's a really, well, he's a terrific writer. And, you know, he's written The Botany of Desire. He's written Omnivore's Dilemma, all these really great books about the agriculture. He's on the new lecture series at UCSB. Is he? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's a really fascinating book because he's a guy who... Um, was never wanted anything to do with psycho, psychotropic, psychedelic drugs, and and uh, and he ends up exploring, you know, all the people who've continued the research or tried to over the years, and then he ends up trying several himself, and as a total, you know, oh my God, you know, so, and so it's a really fascinating, fascinating book, and he writes about Stan Groff in the book, which is what made me think of it. Any guys in the back that uh, have some thoughts or questions? Yeah, okay. Hi, hi. Um, I was curious about the Waldorf School, because when my son was uh, about four or five, I was making, we had a group in Santa Monica, and I was making gnomes for him, and I had thought of sending him there, but I had an issue with the fact that when they draw, they can't draw bold colors, um, so they can't draw reds and blacks, and everything has to be pastel. 
Gee, I don't know about that. I don't know. That seem, I don't think that all Waldorf schools are that rigid. Certainly, but um, you know, it, it is a. It it, they have ways of approaching learning that are different than you know. It's fantastic. I mean, they make their own books. They yeah. Have their own they tell history through they have this, or, you know, so yeah. wonderful. Yeah, they have the same teacher stick with the kids through the through the grades. And the one that we're looking to get going in Watts, we're eventually just gonna give it to the community because or or to Orlando will will help do that too. But um, it's it will be because Waldorf can be very Eurocentric if you just right. import it. But I, well, we want to do things. We've got a couple people now as school leaders as we approach the charter uh, approval process that, you know, we'll bring in drumming. We'll, we want to make school, hope to see the school made, in, you know, into a creative learning experience for kids where art is, is really highlighted. I'm not an expert on Waldorf at all. I'm never a Waldorf teacher or anything, but I know that the artistic is highlighted. I was just wondering how you felt about that. That particular thing, I'm just not that familiar with. I suspect that. it's because, you know, Steiner uh, was very much a mystic, and he very yeah. much thought that uh, individual, the overemphasis of individualism and sensory stimulation, mm -hmm. not, he, he valued the Quakers, not that he wanted people to be Quakers, but he, he valued, like, getting in touch with the mystical ground of being first and believed that yeah. training kids to be stimulated, stimulated, stimulated was actually a distraction from helping them get in touch. My theory is that that might have something to do well, with it. Well, except it wasn't about teaching them to use that. If they, if they had an intuition or a feeling to draw something like that, they wouldn't be allowed to. Interesting. Well, that's it. That's so, it. That, that's not. That's not the way it ought to be. But so yeah. Maybe you know. Maybe it's changed a long time ago. Well. Yeah. I'm, I'm not. I'm not sure. Yeah. What do you? Just something that like, I mean, We were showing yeah, the size of the art that he was making, and then there was one that looked like a labyrinth, mm -hmm. or well, maybe an electric circuit, but kind yeah. of like a labyrinth. And the next one, when you said it looked like kind of a bird, and to me, it reminded me of Icarus. Yeah, Icarus. Flying away from the oh. oh, that's interesting. Huh. He was able to get away from the man-made wings. Man man yeah, hmm. yeah, and he was doing the. He, that was his process. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you. If I, if I, because that it becomes symbolic of the sunset. Well, I wanted to share that that <coughs> moment with the Kintumble, the little people yeah. that really seemed to be a pivotal moment in his healing. There's a moment where in Greek mythology where a little dwarf is instrumental to the healing of somebody's perception. And that might be an interesting myth for you. Mm -hmm. What happens is uh, Orion uh, is at Oenopian's house. Oenopian means wine in the face. So Orion's at Oenopian's house, and Oenopian says, don't touch my daughter. And Orion gets uh, handsy with the daughter, and then Oenopian, uh, to punish, to, in retribution, gets Orion drunk and stabs out his eyes. Orion then calls, you know, to, his, to Hephaestus, you know, I've been wronged, please help me, uh, and I've lost my eyes. Hephaestus, uh, you know, says, you know, he has to go through a sort of forgive, uh, uh, repenting process, but Hephaestus sends his little dwarf helper, Kedalion, and Kedalion gets on his shoulders, mm. walks him to the sunrise, and as he watches the sunrise with Kedalion there, his perceptions return. Wow. Wow. That's really... And, you know, with Daedalus, you're back with the bull again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 with the bull and with the thread that you need to, you know, find your way out from it. Yeah. Do you yeah. want to jump in with this? And what's, what's your name? I'm sorry, you're... My name? Yes, please. Yeah, I'm Siona. Hi, welcome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I wanted to say how much I appreciated this talk. I've been members of other Jungian groups, and Jungian psychology has a complicated relationship with race. I deeply appreciated how you brought together the mythology with the very lived reality um, of those spaces in that world. It's one of the things that came coming up for me in part thanks to my husband was just that your story of the shackles and the number of black men in this country who remain in shackles yeah. today. And it is it takes so much to connect those two in a way that, you know, it doesn't make sense, but it does make sense. So mm -hmm. I that moved me deeply, and it was I appreciated that aspect. Of mm. that. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's true, you know, 30% of, uh, of all black men in this country under 30 are in prison. One third. It's Leonor, you want to share some thoughts with us too? Yeah, I wanted to say that I was moved um, by your 
by the contagion of intuitiveness. Hmm. It seems to me you, you um, embody and you trigger. And I think that it's interesting how the trajectories of Romanian thinking, you know, the, the, the syncopation of archetypes and the, and the watching of archetypal energy in movement with other archetypes and the way that you helped Franklin um, become less of a concretized ego mm. and move because pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical products yeah. are analogs. They're never organic products. The right. body can't process them and it stores them in weird ways. And when a patent runs out, the way that a pharmaceutical company maintains that patent is to double the strength. So yeah. you're always crippled in your ego when you're ingesting them. And what I think was fascinating about what you were describing about going to Aladoma's hometown was that you you went on a you you were embodying what Hillman teaches. Hmm. You were becoming archetypal energy, even as he was describing to you to sit and be with, you actually traveled and were with. You, you went to a place where all of his four brain waves could actually um, become re-regulated. Mm -hmm. The pharmaceutical product affects dysregulation. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there is a, a, an epigenetic factor, but, there, but there's also who knows to whatever extent a, a, a traumatic factor. You know, you could have sure. had an over-registration of trauma. Mm -hmm. uh, it could have been before your birth. It could have been in utero. It could have been, as with Romeo, in his childhood. And, and of course, that hyper-regulates your four brainwave patterns because your alpha brainwaves, your conscious, your egoic function is hyper-stimulated, looking for the danger that you've been you know, that's, that's what your homeostatic, you know, that's, that's how you're functioning, looking for the danger. Mm -hmm. Right. I wanted to say, too, I was at Pacifica when you came up with Romeo. Mm. And I was so moved by your energy. You were so um, much yourself a container uh, of kindness and of very warm... Uh, allowing um, paternal energy and he is so bright and he has such a sweetness and mm. there is something very moving about the environment that he clearly grew up in which is which is really it, it's so easy to describe urban trauma as a racial condition but it's an economic condition yeah oh absolutely primarily mm -hmm. race is always a substrate Mm -hmm. You know, it's a substrate of, of, of an economic condition. And he is so young, even to be able to transcend it, to, to, to jump into, you know, on the back of a heroic energy and a myth, yeah. it is a sophisticated process. And, and, and without his being able to go to Africa, where basically th there is an embodiment, <laughs> myth is um, an embodiment of what Hillman teaches do. So there's something so moving about how your intuition to to be open to helping Franklin had a contagious factor, that was all to say. Hmm. And I think it seems to me Franklin's going to Africa, that's such a healing thing because, because allowing your unconscious um, process to affect other people's unconscious process has to be enormously powerful. To, and, and this is not that culture. Yeah. This is not the culture that allows you to do that. This is the culture that says, no, no, you need to be regulated. You, right. you need to not be threatening. And then, of course, um, and then race is a, another overlay so, yeah. of threat. Mm -hmm. of, and, and, and myth is important for, as a biracial person myself, I have to say, myth is important because in this culture, as in most, history is always, the myth that is your cultural narrative is always written by the victors. And you are deliberately written out right. so that so 
so that the myth can be conveyed as one particular cohesive narrative. And so to find yourself when your, whatever, your intellectual property has never been valorized, your, your, your bravery has never been valorized, for someone like Franklin to find himself in a myth that's deliberately designed not to, not to allow him to compete Mm -hmm. the dominant narrative, um, that you had the intuition to help him do that, to help anyone do that. If he had been Irish, I think you would have had the intuition <laughs> yeah. to help him find some other way mm -hmm. than making himself smaller. Yeah. It must have been a really hard thing. I just have to say, I, I'm moved by your heart, and I'm moved by Franklin's, and I was very moved by Romeo. He's mm -hmm. adorable. Mm -hmm. He's an adorable soul. He is. Has to be something spectacular for him to have even one person, for any of us, for one person to reach out and have their unconscious processing be still vulnerable and accessible. It always excites mm -hmm. other people's unconscious processing. And, and that is a amazing thing. One last thing was I wanted to ask you you said you wrote a book, which I did not know, um, about, what, what was the name of it about? Black genius. Black genius. Yeah, it was the second book I wrote, and um, it it started out as the publisher wanted um, an answer to that horrible book, The Bell Curve, which came out in the 90s, which you know was about in ratings of intelligence and black people weren't as smart and everything. But it, it turned into a whole other thing, and it was actually it kind of now that I look back on it, it's 20 years ago now that it came out, and it pre, kind of presaged all this in a way because I had chapters. Uh, the book was really about relationships, in uh, the importance of mentors and family in African American culture. For example, the first section was called The Education of Wynton Marsalis. So I interviewed Wynton, I interviewed Albert Murray, who took him under his wing and, and introduced him to Ralph Ellison and the artist Romare Bearden. And, it was, and, and that's how Wynton learned about Louis Armstrong and Duke Ellington, was through these older uh, mentors. And, uh, so, and then I had chapters called Ancestors. So it's weird. I mean, it's weird in the sense that it's not really weird, but it's like, you know, later I, I would fall, I had to personally go through a lot of these things, but I um, had no idea at the time. I mean, I wrote it, I dedicated it to Franklin, who was, you know, had, had at that point, yeah, he had just had his breakdown, I guess. But, um, uh, but the ancestors chapters, I had, a I had, for example, a comparative chapter about Douglas and Baldwin, finding that the, how their lives mirrored one another, what they were doing mirrored one another 100 years apart, almost exactly 100 years apart, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement. And they were kind of writing about and talking about the same things. It was fascinating to me. And then Sojourner Truth was an ancestor. And so anyway, it was, it was, uh, it, it was a very... Um, well, an important book for me, too, because most of my friends didn't think I had any right to write it. Mm -hmm. You know, what is this, uh, what, what, you don't know this culture, you know, what are you talking about? But, but it was a, a wonderful experience to, to get to interview, you know, a lot of the people I did, like Jacob Lawrence and Winton and Albert Murray was a profound thinker. And uh, so, anyway, that's in a nutshell what it was. And, and now that I think about it, it did, you know, kind of, Presage some of the things I've been talking about today, and and my deep rooted <laughs> uh, fascination with uh, African and African American culture. I mean, I spent almost a year in Africa when I was in my twenties, and hitchhiked the Sahara. I spent two months in Ghana, I was, you know, on the other coast, and incredible um, experiences that that uh, shaped my life. Does anybody else have some thoughts or questions? They want to. I I didn't know. Yeah. Somebody else help. Um, I don't see what else. Go ahead. <laughs> I find this also so fascinating and moving that your story is like a merger of ancestor work and amplification, which is the Jungian uh, one of the Jungian tools which Hillman used a lot too, whereby you take this. So you walked into his into your son's dream, basically. And you started to amplify these images. And the shackle, you actually, the, it's an amplification as well of this energy and the relationship that you had with it and how it started to transform everything. It mm -hmm. changed your life completely. 
and in a nutshell, that's what Jungian analysis is. Mm. You're not concretizing anything. You're you're living in a dream world. Yeah. You're you're letting these symbols marinate mm -hmm. and become part of you without analysis, really. I mean, that's my understanding of Jungian analysis: is that you're not you're not trying to concretize anything. And Hillman was very. Oh yeah, he was absolutely. Um, active imagination. Yeah. It's a lot of the work that I did in my dissertation. Mm -hmm. But but you're the proof <laughs> of what happens. Yeah. Well. You, you walk into a dream like this. Well, much preferable to the outcome of Shutter Island, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So it's a beautiful, beautiful story. Mm -hmm. So many, so many levels. Thank you. Yeah. Someday I want to write the. I, I used to, I've taped a lot with Romeo. I mean, many, many, many hours of him talking about his early life and what he, things he went through or what he experienced at Pacific. I mean, I just, he was so goddamn eloquent. I mean, I just carried my tape recorder and, you know, said, turn it on. And so someday I, will, I would like to write a book with him. But I, not, I don't know quite when that'll be. Uh, I've, I mean, he's at a point now where he's 20 and almost 21, and, and it's been a kind of a, uh, well, painful in a, for me too to let go of him in a way, you know. So let him, let him find, let him find his way, you know. Instead of, because there's a very fine line in, in these in a relationship like that, a mentoring mentee relationship when you, you know, when you just uh, you he has so much potential and you want so much for him to be who you see he can be. And yet he's got to find it, you know. He's got to be able to find it, and I can't. Well, you've given him so much. I, I hope it's a fa enough of a found something of a foundation where he will be able to become the man that I'll, I mean. Everybody who met him has just said, "My God, you know, who is this kid?" And I had never met a kid like him. I mean, and he, and he, and and of course, psychologically too. I mean, he gave me something that my own son couldn't. You know, I mean, he. He 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 was like me, you know, and he loved to public speak. He was a writer, you know. I mean, he, and and my, my son's a terrific writer, but uh, he, but anyway, he, if you know what I mean, I mean, Franklin's he's given me a lot, and I've tried to give him a lot, but it's a different kind of relationship. And also, of course, something like one with Romeo is also can be um, <clears throat> more dangerous in a way. I mean, because it's really you know pulls on on. Uh, it pulls on me, you know, and, and, and it fulfills something in me, and I have, to, I have to be, have had to be careful of how much of it is me imposing something on him, and uh, and it him. It sounds like Franklin is more of an introvert, right? Yeah, uh, Franklin is more of the extrovert. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I would say that that's that's true. I get the feel just from seeing his photos how soulful something Franklin is. Yeah. Oh, he's a, he is a deep cat. <laughs> he's is it very meaningful to your son to have? Uh, does it give it, it? Does it extend the family in a way that makes him feel more? The, the my relationship with Romeo? Or, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's double edged. Yeah. I think it it has, but at the same time, his mom told me that you know he's he's kind of jealous of Romeo hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. um, because I, I I I am just Franklin wasn't <laughs> out here when. When Romeo's been out here, no, Franklin hasn't been here in, in years to LA. So, so they've never met, but there is a there is a soul connection there that I've felt and. Seen. If you've taken Franklin to Africa and all these other places, is there some part of you that's not letting them meet? No, I don't think so. I mean, I would. Um, like either taking Romeo to Baltimore. Oh, something or like that. Franklin to Las Vegas. I don't know. I, 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 it could be, but I, I, I don't. I, I'm not aware of that as a, as a, because I, in a sense, I, like I say, I feel like they have met, <laughs> that they're they're connected in a way that maybe they don't have to meet physically. You know, maybe they will someday. I mean, um, but. Anyway, but, uh, yeah. I have a voice in my own head that's, that's going on. Um, it's, and it's, it's shaping, so I, this, is, this isn't very um, coherent yet, but, uh, but I'm really noticing how much you seem to be embodying the father archetype. Mm. 
as I'm listening, and um, and I think about Jung when he had you know his you know little fits, and he stayed home from school, and then he o overheard his father one day telling somebody, "I'm really concerned about him," mm -hmm. and that was kind of an awakening. Mm -hmm. And after that, he you know shook it off and like broke the habit and went back to school and was very studious. Mm -hmm. So it was the voice of the father. That, that called him forth, and I and I really hear you as that father. And the father is not another mother; it's not a second mm -hmm. mother. And the father interfaces with the culture. Mm. And and what I hear in the you know going to Africa to Maladon, Somme, the you know the various people like you are interfacing your son with the culture and helping him step into him mm -hmm. his own being. Mm -hmm. But you're building that bridge to the outer world. Mm. And as you told the shackle story, and I have to tell you, I had mixed feelings about kind of wanting to see an image of the shackle. I don't know if you <laughs> took a photo. Part of me I wanted didn't. to see it, and part of me didn't. So mm -hmm. it was really very powerful in that sense. But but what you did and that journey and the way you were, you know, bringing these cultures together, and I thought, you know, this is the father, and we don't have enough of this archetype in our culture right now mm. of men, mature men, doing this work to build these bridges, to, to make these contacts. And so I thank you for that. Oh, well, thank you. You know, we don't. And I remember I went to a youth initiation uh, retreat weekend when I first was getting into Romeo wasn't there. It was, but it was a bunch of kids, and I didn't know know any of them. And the Youth Mentoring Connection and Street Poets, another great organization in the area, uh, were doing it. And there were like 50 kids and 50, you know, 20 mentors or something. But, but oh my God, I mean, I, I the first because they were all talking, you know, the, like the first night, and and it was so devastating because none of these kids, none of these, they were all boys. I mean, none of them had fathers. I mean, the fathers were all totally absent from their lives. And, you know, of course, they'd been through the traumas and everything. I could barely get through that night. I mean, I thought I was going to die, you know, because it was just so, I had no idea. They, they'd gone in and done research. So I did a little research on the good father at one point. I was so disinterested in that archetype. But the more I studied, the more I was like, this is amazing. And they'd gone into communities and looked. And when there's no father there, the, you know, the mm -hmm. problems are just enormous. And then they go into you know the the community next door where the fathers are, mm -hmm. and it's a completely different experience. The, the relationships mm -hmm. are so much stronger, and you know, crime is less, and on and on. I can't I can't recite all the statistics, but I'm right. telling you there are studies out there. Mm -hmm. The presence of the father <clears throat> is so important. Well, yeah. it's also why things like what Kwame does mm -hmm. is so yes. important. Yeah, uh, because for me, I think that the father, your your biological father, is certainly important, somewhat as your primary point of projection for the archetypal father. But in some ways, the archetypal father is, is at your cultivation of your own sense of what a good father is, is almost as important to me as having a relationship with a father. And so these great role models and mentors become opportunities for you to cultivate and develop your mm -hmm. own sense of what a father is on the inside. <clears throat> and would you say that's with Hellman and Bly? And sure. That's exactly what this whole men's world and it was about, and what these and, and these remarkable organizations like Youth Mentoring and Street Poets and Inside Out Writers is another one that I was discovered that you know where they they take they teach they go into juvenile detention facilities and they get kids into writing and then when they come out they want to be part of it still and you know because then they have something I mean I mean you know R Romeo like never had anybody he, he said I never I never imagined a place like Pacifica existed. He said, I love myth, but, you know, there was nobody to talk to about it. Nobody cared. And so and, and to, I felt like he was teaching me because I don't know as much about mythology as I would like to. And here was suddenly this boy, you know, who knew every myth in every culture. And, and here I was, Hellman's biographer, and I don't know as much about myth as I should. So, you know, I'd listen to him, and, and he would get me ex more excited about the myths, and I don't know, it was just the damnedest well, thing. Well, and it's so cool, because you interfaced him to the Getty, you yeah. interfaced him to Pacifica, so that's where I see that father bridge mm -hmm. experience mm -hmm. taking place. Yeah. So I know we're going to come to an end. I want to make just one quick point on what you said. Uh, nobody cared or nobody... The, the one thing that really strikes me is uh, some of you may have read the book Invisible Man, uh, yeah, Ralph Elf, Elf, amazing Elf, book, right? And uh, it, it engages like how you know 
his experience was to feel invisible, to feel unseen. One thing that's striking me is the potency of the fact that uh, the symbolic action of the shackle throwing, you needed it, you used the word invisible. Mm -hmm. uh, and so to me it's striking that uh, even, what, even what's going on now, even the healing process remains in a place of invisibility. Yeah. Yeah, it does. Um, but it's pretty awesome that you're that you're writing about it. Mm, thank you. When you threw it over, I really heard the splash. <laughs> did you? <laughs> yeah. You know, I think I did too. The <laughs> image of it. Yeah. I, I just I I think you you speak in images. Uh, huh. And uh, I never think of myself that way. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, you do. Oh, thank so you. let me wind it down, please. Um, I'm going to return to my old form, Robin, and I'd like next it time. I'd like yeah, it. well, I, you know, I'm intimidated when I'm surrounded by experts, and there are so many great minds in our community, and I, I am just touched by the people who come, and we're all we make it up. I mean, we, you know, this is one huge improvisation and and we, we hear the music and we we dance. I remember seeing Hillman dance oh yeah tap so dance I am <gasps> yes <laughs> right it with his oh, with his green he would love to wear green and and I just really dick I appreciate you bringing this tonight the other aspects of Romeo and Franklin just enrich it I mean, it's like, it's been a beautiful evening. And oh, I, thank you. I thank you. So we, we kind of unring it and then we <laughs> turn it off. And okay. then I'll put you out in the kitchen and you can talk with people who want to talk more about the book. Okay. If this thing, if that 360 thing works, I'm going to be really excited about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Alright, let me give you some space so people can come talk with you. But I, I have some things right. offline, I'd love to catch up with you. Thank you. Yeah, let me